Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and uh, this is Manish, and I've got uh, my colleagues from Digital Asset, uh, Dimitri and Moritz, uh, who are going to be taking you through the concept of Daml triggers. Uh, so Daml triggers, as you may have heard, or you've seen in the description of the webinar, is about automating, um, automating events uh, on a Daml ledger. So very simply put, if you have a contract that is created, take some action automatically based on that. So if there's a new invoice proposal that has come in, uh, then take some action, maybe send it to verification, notify the party that is uh, responsible for verifying the invoice, uh, et cetera, automatically uh, using DAML. And, um, and the beauty is, of course, you can do that in DAML now, using DAML now, instead of trying to use, a, use another general purpose language and uh, which sits on top of the ledger. So uh, without further ado then, uh, and uh, I'm going to be recording the session, obviously. So uh, we'll send out the recording after the webinar. We'll also put it on YouTube and on the Discuss Forum as well. So for those of you who are unable to stay for the full session, or if any of your colleagues wanted to attend but they couldn't, uh, feel free to send them the link and let them know. Okay, all right then. So uh, Dimitri, over to you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, if you can unshare so I can share yeah. my screen. Okay, so uh, I guess you, uh, Manish, you did uh, already make an intro, so I'm not going to bore uh, the audience with uh, more slides. So as you mentioned, um, DAML triggers, uh, they are off-ledger automation. Uh, they're written in DAML, so uh, the usual uh, uh, strict typing and um, uh, power of DAML that, that we're used to in our smart contracts. Uh, and they interact only with the ledger. So uh, this is not, you would not use ever a trigger to... Uh, to call it say, an, an external API. Uh, so you would you use it for uh, simple uh, automation and syncing uh, tasks uh, that, are, that are triggered uh, off ledger. Uh, so why, uh, what's the motivation behind them? Uh, we feel that there's a lot less friction uh, when things are in DAML, uh, both the models are in DAML and the automation is in DAML, uh, given that you don't have to tra translate all these data payloads you know, to JSON back and forth or to whatever other binding uh, you have chosen. Uh, and there's less code duplication as well in terms of checking things, right? So you, you could leverage the insurers and the, um, and the assertion that DAML uh, provides you uh, straight out of the model instead of, uh, instead of uh, having to write some of that logic on your, on your client. Uh, and last but not least, there's a fairly straightforward interface uh, with a few functions that you can uh, define uh, that uh, let you uh, keep uh, user-defined state updated, uh, some rules on, on uh, you know, if this, then uh, that. Uh, signal, um, uh, set up your, hook up your triggers to specific uh, template events, and then also the ability to fire things uh, on a timer, which is that heartbeat uh, that you see here at the uh, last line. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's uh, see like a hands-on example, basically, of this. And again, uh, if you have a question, feel free to post it on the Q&A section, uh, or just uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll answer a few at the uh, end of this. Um, okay, so to start, uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, uh, draw inspiration, actually pretty much uh, uh, take a, a newer version of, of what, uh, of this blog post, uh, which demonstrates DAML triggers and the, um, the setup would be in terms of a, a vacation tracker within a company. So we, we would have uh, Acme uh, Corporation being a, a company and two parties, Alice and Bob, where Alice is uh, Bob's uh, boss. Uh, and uh, Bob basically signs their employee contract with a company that uh, gives them some sort of uh, vacation allocation. Uh, and then uh, Bob is requesting uh, vacation days uh, from uh, his boss, uh, Alice. Now, Alice, because she's in a good mood, uh, she'll have a trigger uh, to auto accept. Uh, any vacation request that, that Bob makes, as long as uh, that vacation uh, is not uh, is is um, below the allocated days, uh, you can. We'll have this uh, link on this uh, blog post that which describes this thing in more detail uh, for everyone who's interested, and we'll, we'll share the, the link at the end of this uh, webinar as well. Uh, so let's jump into the uh, to the code. I'll, I'll launch uh, VS Code uh, here, uh, and I'll. Uh, resize it. So what we have is uh, we have this model, uh, simple model. There are three templates. There's this agreement between the employee and the company that defines how many uh, vacation days are remaining for this employee at this company with this boss. 
uh, this uh, contract is created through a proposal contract. So this is the contract, the proposal contract that essentially creates this uh, agreement. Uh, and then uh, the employee can issue vacation requests that are uh, then accepted uh, from the boss and turned into uh, uh, vacation contracts. Uh, and to drive this uh, thing, just, just to see what, uh, what it looks like, uh, we do have a vacation uh, allocation that um, employee Bob has. Uh, they, he has 29 remaining days uh, because he requested a vacation uh, from Alice, which was approved uh, manually in this case, in the scenario by Alice uh, for uh, August um, 12th, so for tomorrow. Uh, now, what we want to do is we want to write this auto accept trigger so that Alice doesn't have to manually uh, see each uh, vacation uh, request and, um, and accept it. So if I just want to show you this vacation request, which was archived and it's here and it was translated into this uh, vacation contract. Um, so to do that, we'll uh, write a trigger. And to, to write a trigger, what we need is a simple, uh, it's just a demo file. Um, so I'll just put it here. Uh, and we need to implement uh, this interface. So this interface is nothing but a uh, few uh, set of functions. Uh, the first one uh, is um, a function that's called uh, upon uh, running the trigger once. Uh, and this gives us a chance to read from the ACS. The ACS is basically the active contract set that this party can, uh, can see and define uh, and, and hydrate, let's say, prepare a user state, which could be anything we denote this by, by S. Uh, then each uh, message that comes in, whether it's a transaction or a command completion, uh, triggers this update state and gives us the opportunity to uh, uh, combine anything that's in the active contract state plus this uh, message we receive. Uh, in our existing state uh, to update our next user state. Uh, then we have this rule, which is the meat basically of this uh, of the of the trigger, uh, which is um, run by a specific party. Uh, it has access to the ACS. It has access to the existing time in case we want to do anything time uh, related, uh, and it gives us a, a set of in-flight uh, commands. So commands that we have already submitted on the ledger. Uh, but we haven't uh, heard the uh, completion uh, back yet. And our user defined state, obviously. And combining all these, what we do is we submit uh, uh, a set of commands uh, wrapped around the trigger A. This, this trigger A is nothing but, uh, you, would, you could think of, uh, of it as a scenario when you're writing scenarios, so like a do block scenario do, or like an update uh, monad uh, on, which is um, the equivalent on the DAML models. Uh, just a return type. Uh, um, and then uh, register templates, I, I hinted to this before in these slides, is basically what we want as far as uh, hooks for this trigger. Uh, so when does this trigger uh, actually um, execute? Uh, and we can, you know, there's a, there's a convenience that we could uh, say that this uh, um, trigger should be uh, executed uh, on any DAR or, or on, any, on, any, um, on any template of, of the DAR uh, or uh, filter it down uh, to more specific subset of uh, templates that we're interested in. The only reason we would do such a thing is if we wanted to, uh, to uh, optimize the performance uh, of this trigger. If we, let's say we had a bunch of templates that we didn't want uh, our trigger to, uh, to be spammed with. We would just isolate the, the ones that uh, made sense for, this, uh, for these rules. And last but not least, uh, there's a heartbeat, uh, which is we would implement this if we want this trigger to fire uh, every uh, specific uh, time interval. So that's why it accepts an optional of uh, relative time here. So let's go ahead and implement uh, this interface. I'll just comment it out. And what I'll do is I'll, I have a cheat sheet uh, here. So I'll bring, I'll bring in some, uh, uh, some code. And I will do the proper inputs and implement the interface. Uh, and Basically, the initialize uh, function is uh, is a no op, uh, which says that we don't really need uh, we don't really need a user state. That's why we've replaced s here with uh, with unit. Uh, I'm getting a linter um, I'm getting a linter suggestion here that because I have a no op, I could use const here, which I'll actually do. Uh, update state again. Uh, this is uh, uh, getting the active contract set and a message and our user defined state and updating our user defined state. But because our user-defined state is, is a unit, we don't need to do anything there either. Uh, for register templates, uh, we could uh, have, we filtered it down just to vacation requests because this is what we would uh, uh, 
uh, want to um, respond to, but we could also uh, remove this and just have something that's called all in bar uh, so that we uh, our trigger response to, to everything. Uh, this is the function that we're going to implement, which is the uh, uh, approval. Um, and then we don't want this trigger to fire in an interval, so we just have uh, none for the heartbeat. Now for the approval rule itself, um, I'll just uh, bring it in the picture. Uh, what we have here is uh, we uh, run it on behalf of a party, which is the boss. Uh, this is our active contract set at the time. We're not interested about the time, uh, any time events here, uh, nor uh, do we care about any commands in flight. So these are underscored and uh, not, not relevant. Uh, and then our user state uh, is also, um, as I said, at the unit. So what we'll do in this trigger is we'll say, uh, we'll fetch uh, any requests. So we'll use this get contracts function, which is uh, imported by the uh, demo trigger uh, library. Uh, and we'll say, let's get all the vacation requests from our ACS. Uh, this gives us a list of top tuples of uh, contract IDs and payloads of vacation requests. And then what we'll do next is we'll, uh, we'll take those requests and uh, filter them down uh, to uh, the actual boss. So we, we are, uh, we're running the party as the boss and we want to all the requests where we are the boss uh, uh, that we need to address because other ones uh, we may be an observer at too and, and we don't really uh, care for them. And then last but not least, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, take this filtered list and we're gonna loop over it and we're just gonna call uh, an exercise uh, on each of those contract IDs, which is the simple accept request. So hence the, uh, the auto accept logic. Uh, there's a little dedupe uh, here, and the reason there is a dedupe and not just an exercise is that uh, there could be uh, some commands uh, in flight. Uh, suppose that we've already responded to a vacation request and our trigger crashes uh, and we, we reestablish a connection and we no longer have uh, the pending set and we try to send uh, the same command. This dedupe uh, um, function will take care of not uh, sending the, uh, the same command uh, twice. Uh, so that, uh, that's all uh, actually we need uh, for the trigger. Uh, and what uh, we should do next is we should uh, uh, actually execute it and see, see how it works. So for this, I'm gonna first uh, save, every, make sure I save uh, everything. Uh, and I will uh, perform a demo start to start the local stack. That, do, that does not start the trigger, that just basically builds the DAR starts the sandbox and starts the, the, the demo navigator. And let's give it a couple of moments. Okay, uh, so we have this thing uh, running. And on a different tab, uh, what we'll do is we'll start the, uh, the demo trigger that we just built. So uh, we do this by issuing a command, which is referencing the uh, uh, vacation trigger DAR that we just compiled. Uh, we have a trigger name, which is called auto proof uh, trigger, which is basically uh, this uh, trigger here, and it lives under the demo uh, trigger uh, directory. Uh, it's connecting to our local host and port, which is where the sandbox is running. And it's running as uh, Alice, which is the boss uh, of Bob uh, and the manager in the Acme company. So I will run this. And we see the message trigger running as Alice. And what we'll do next is we'll uh, try to exercise the same workflow we saw in the scenarios. So first of all, I'll log in as Acme Corporation. I'll go to my templates and I'll create a proposal uh, for Bob, who's an, the employee, so employees Bob, company is Acme uh, Corporation. And uh, the boss is Alice. And let's allocate 30 vacation days uh, for Bob. So we hit on submit. We see that this uh, thing succeeded and we should expect a contract uh, here to appear, which is the employee proposal that we'll go ahead and uh, accept as Bob. So log in as Bob, uh, accept this proposal. Great. And now if I go back to the active contract set of Bob, I see that there's an employee vacation allocation, which if I click on it, I see that uh, I do have 30 uh, days remaining as well. So what I'll do is I'll request uh, a vacation and I'll uh, request a vacation, let's say for tomorrow, set and submit. 
and I see this uh, succeeded. And if I go to contracts, I'm not actually, I don't actually have a vacation request, but I do have an uh, approved vacation right away. And uh, which is what I would expect. Uh, it's the vacation that I requested for um, um, August the 12th. Uh, and just to see that the, the, the bot, uh, the, the trigger um, did its job. Uh, if I say click uh, include archive, I see that indeed I did create a vacation request, uh, which was automatically um, accepted by uh, the trigger bureau. Uh, and that's uh, as easy uh, as, as uh, a few lines of code uh, in demo. Uh, now, there is a little, um, like a little gotcha basically here. And the reason is that if we want to uh, expand the logic of this trigger, uh, we end up uh, writing uh, more, more logic here uh, in, this, in this file. And then once we recompile this DAR, uh, the DAR changes the hash, which the hash is basically this uh, string after the at sign, uh, which means that if we have a long uh, running ledger of a demo model and we just change the automation logic, the automation logic won't be able to talk uh, to our demo model. So a good practice for uh, uh, running a trigger is actually keeping decoupling the model uh, and the trigger on separate DARs. And that's what we'll uh, demonstrate uh, next. So uh, suppose I wanted to uh, change uh, the, the body of this uh, choice of, of this, uh, sorry, the body of this uh, trigger here. And I'd like to use, instead of the dupe exercise, uh, I want to use a new, uh, newer um, uh, function, which is called emit command. Uh, I could do the change here, but I'll prefer to do it in a separate DAR and just import uh, this DAR uh, here. So what I'll do is I'll uh, quit my trigger. I'll switch tabs and I'll just issue uh, a new command, which I'll call a new project, uh, which I'll call uh, standalone uh, trigger. And this just creates uh, a new, um, a new um, uh, project, which I'll go and I'll launch uh, my ID for. And uh, I'll just need to do some uh, cleanup work before I, uh, I add my uh, the trigger file here. So uh, what I'll do first is I don't really need any sort of setup. I'll delete this file. Uh, on my main, I also don't need any of that logic. And on my daml.yaml, uh, what I'll need to do is uh, I will need to uh, add the daml trigger dependency. So I'll remove the script that I don't need to change it to daml trigger. So daml, daml uh, trigger here. Uh, and uh, I'll also import uh, the, the dar that contains my model. So by doing this, uh, they happen to be on the same directory. So this is like a relative path. My vacation tracker or my vacation uh, uh, trigger uh, dot dar. So this is what I will need to do on my daml.yaml file. And then on my main, uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, uh, paste uh, this uh, um, pretty much the same uh, trigger logic that I, had, uh, that I had before. And I'll give it a refresh just because I did an import and I want this um, uh, VS Code to understand what I'm importing uh, here. Uh, and again, I have this linter suggestion that I can get rid of. Okay, uh, and as you can see here, I've uh, slightly changed the uh, logic of the, of the, um, the body of the trigger. Uh, the logic remains the same, it's just the implementation is different. So what I'm doing here instead is I'm saying that um, uh, from, the, uh, from the requests that are filtered for this boss, uh, let's go ahead and just uh, keep the contract IDs. So this is just a list of uh, contract IDs of vacation requests. Uh, then I'm going to create a list of commands. So for each of those contract IDs, I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to exercise the accept request. So I have a list of commands. And then unless my commands are void, so unless I don't have any empty, uh, like any commands to send, uh, I'll uh, call this thing called emit commands, which will accept my commands and will also um, uh, accept a list of uh, uh, contract IDs. And the reason for this argument here, it may be a bit confusing to begin with, but this is what I am marking as in flight. So this is a, 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 convenience, uh, a convenient way of saying that because I'm sending this set of commands, uh, the next time that I'm gonna do a get uh, here, uh, these commands are gonna be, fil th these contracts are gonna be filtered out uh, from the get. So I will never submit um, 
a set of commands that are doing the same, uh, operating on the same uh, contract ID. So this is also handled uh, on the daml trigger library itself. Um, so I've changed my logic. I've imported my daml uh, model. Um, and what I'll do next is just build this thing and run it against the uh, long running sandbox that I haven't, uh, I still have running here. Um, so I'll save and I'll go to my, uh, to my trigger code. I'll do a demo build. My trigger built. And what I'll do next is I'll issue a very similar command uh, to the one I used to run the previous trigger. Uh, but instead now I'm referencing the actual standalone trigger DAR. So I'm not referencing, oops, I'm not referencing the model DAR. I'm referencing my uh, trigger DAR. Uh, my trigger name is uh, under main now, auto proof trigger, which is this main uh, auto proof trigger. Uh, and uh, again, I'm connecting to the same sandbox uh, and I'm doing this as Alice. So I'm, I'll run this. Trigger is running. Uh, and I'll just repeat this. Uh, uh, workflow. Uh, we're still logged in as Bob. Uh, we already have a vacation approved. Uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, try again uh, and ask for a new uh, vacation day. So I'll say request vacation. Um, we've already taken the 12th, so let's take the 13th. I'll hit submit. And as I can see here, I have another uh, vacation and indeed another uh, two uh, vacation requests as well. And just to show that this is uh, th it's a trigger actually doing the work, what I could do is I could uh, uh, cancel uh, the execution of this uh, and retry this and request another date. I'll request the 14th. Hit submit. I still get the success, uh, but uh, this is now a vacation request. Um, it's not uh, auto approved because I'm not running the trigger. Uh, and that's Pretty much it in terms of, uh, in terms of um, the, uh, how triggers work and what is the best practice on decoupling the model uh, and the trigger. Uh, there's a more complicated example, uh, like a deeper dive, uh, if you will, which we have on our documentation page. So if you go to our docs.daml.com, there's an early access features section. Uh, and under that, there's the daml triggers uh, automation. And this talks about uh, a trigger which basically syncs uh, uh, instances of the original uh, template uh, to, um, to different subscribers of that original uh, template. It's slightly more involved logic, but gives you a better understanding of, of uh, the power uh, that triggers offer. And then last but not least, there's this um, uh, library for uh, triggers, which does have all the uh, get contracts and dedupe uh, functions that I uh, demonstrated, as well as this submit commands uh, function that we, uh, that we used on our uh, decoupled uh, example. Uh, and uh, I've also have uh, these links here. I'll just make them full screen so they get recorded uh, and um, for anyone to go and explore uh, later. And we also have this uh, ready to go example, um, which is straight off the uh, daml CLI. So instead of just doing daml new my example, I just could do daml new my example and add this copy trigger. And this will instantiate a skeleton project based off of the uh, copy trigger logic. So it will give me uh, uh, this copy trigger that's on the documentation, which I could just go ahead and run or modify according to my, uh, uh, to my needs. Uh, and that should uh, sum up the, um, uh, the uh, webinar uh, for today. If you guys have questions, uh, we'd love to hear them. Uh, and as Manish said, this is gonna be recorded. So uh, we will set, share the link so you guys can take your time and uh, follow along this example uh, on the recorded version. Yeah, thank you so much, Dimitri. Also, uh, just so everybody knows, uh, we'll probably be covering in the next coming weeks, we'll be covering how to use daml triggers on Project Devil, um, which is, uh, you know, which many of you may be using. Uh, so we'll do a session on that and we may also be doing a, we'll also probably be doing a session on, uh, on using triggers uh, on a, on a DLT, you know, such as a, when, on a sawtooth instance or, or how do you do it when it's on, when it's your own instance of Daml on Postgres uh, on, maybe on the cloud. So we'll cover some of those topics. They should be straightforward, but it helps to, um, you know, just go through a tutorial like this.
Okay, any questions from the audience? Let me check the Q&A. Um, I don't think we've got any open questions. Um, but I did have one. <laughs> so it was, so when you run the trigger, you specify the party ID, right? Uh, not, the, not the security token or the JWT token of the user. Yes, in this case, we, we did a local run against localhost and yeah. our parties are um, human readable strings. Uh, yeah. But I guess if this were running on a, on a production setup and no lo lo not localhost, these would be uh, ledger party IDs. Okay. And another and question. Specify an access token. So there's an access token file flag, which is the same that all our other SDK tools like demo script and navigator and so on accept. So if you're running against an authenticated ledger, you can specify that and it's still supported. Okay, perfect. And uh, you also mentioned there is a time interval, right? Uh, like triggers can run um, against a predetermined time interval. What is the difference between that option and the other, which the one that we just executed? Is it that it's constantly polling or what is the, what is the difference between the two options? So the time interval is useful if your rule depends on the time. So let's say you, you have some proposal contracts and those proposals can only be, be executed until a certain time. Like you just have some, some deadline and afterwards they cannot be accepted anymore. So then what you could do is have a trigger that auto archives tri uh, proposals that have, been ex that have expired. So in that case, you want to make sure that your trigger runs, I don't know, every five minutes or so, even if there have been no changes to the contract. So you can archive those, those expired proposals at a time fashion and don't have to wait until some, some arbitrary ledger event happens that triggers your, your rule. Okay, got it, Moritz. Thank you so much. And I think there's a question now from Peter, Peter White to, um, Dimitri, can you see the question? Uh, did the original did you represent the possibility of a half completed transaction taking place? Assuming the code crashed at some point. No, so as everything in demo, this is transactional. So there's no, there's no chance of this being half complete. Either it happens or it doesn't happen. Okay, good. So hopefully, Peter, that answers your question. And then there's a, que a question from Yori. In a recent SDK update, you talked about a trigger service. Uh, could you yeah. elaborate on that? What is the trigger service? So if, if you looked at how this works, as, as Dimitri just told, the demo trigger command accepts a single trigger and a single party. So let's say you have like a thousand parties on your trigger and each of them wants to run the, the auto accept bot. So you have a very large company. Well, I don't know, something else where, where each party wants to run a trigger. So you have a lot of these triggers and potentially also different triggers. Then spinning up thousands of these processes and each of them is currently a Java virtual machine, so they're fairly expensive, doesn't really scale, right? It's annoying to manage and just very resource intensive. You need a very large machine for that. So the trigger service basically wraps this all in, in a service where you start your service once and then you can dynamically say start this trigger as this person and the single trigger process will take care of managing all of these triggers and will do that with significantly less resources and in a more nicer and more dynamic fashion than just starting up all these processes manually. Okay, get it. So Yori, hopefully that answered your question and then we'll probably cover this in a subsequent uh, session as well. Any other questions from the audience? Nope. Um, so that's great. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Dimitri, Moritz, any closing remarks? Uh, just check it out. If, if you have any feedback, we're always happy to hear it. Just ping us on the forum. That's a good way to get us in, in touch with us. And we're happy to hear any feedback or see triggers that we've built and learn from it. Yep. And, and I also want to hint something uh, for any user of uh, Project Dabble as well. Uh, we are in the process of uh, supporting uh, triggers and running them, uh, and we're hardening those um, the UX around it as well. So uh, stay tuned because these are going to be working uh, very nicely on uh, Project Devil as well. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Thank you, Moritz. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, of course, I'll post the recording on YouTube uh, as well as on uh, on the on Discuss. Um, so if you have any questions, just get in touch with us. Thank you so much. Bye.